circumcise my ears, that I may hear you, tenderize my heart, that I may receive you, focus my eyes so that I may see you, diminish the distractions so that I may perceive you, deal with my doubts so I can believe you, awaken me to your word that I may live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 4, verses 19 through 24 reads on this wise. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in the mountain, but you Jews say that the place of worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, believe me, woman. (laughs) I like when he get right to the point. An hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. I'm in verse 23. But an hour is coming. I dare you just repeat after me and say an hour is coming. And is now. Hmm. So the hour is coming and it is now. I ain't got time to deal with it. It's it's what you call a paradox. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people. Hold on, wait. So God the Father, what does he want? He wants such people. To worship him. This is why praise and worship should never be a struggle. Verse 24, and I'm done. God is spirit. I know they're trying to figure out if he's male or female, but the Bible tells us God is spirit. I know they're saying the Holy Ghost is a female online, but the Bible says God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Father, preach through me in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the foundational pieces of who we are is worship. The reality of every human that is in this house is you were created with one purpose, and that purpose was for worship. Another type of church group says that we were created for his good pleasure. In other words, we were created because he wanted a creation that would begin to praise him and worship him by their own free will. Uh, There are certain things that have been created that does not have the option to worship God. They were only able to worship God. Uh, It's kind of like my TV. My TV cannot cook food for me because it does not have that capability. It does not have that will built into it to do so. But the beauty of who we are is we get to worship God under our own will and cognition. We are able to worship God under our own what we call free will. And so when we begin to understand this, uh, this is the bedrock. This is the foundational piece of this church. We understand that Jesus is the chief cornerstone, uh, but along that cornerstone one of the foundational principles of this church is worship. Uh, I'll say it another way. The way we do things here is we have uh, three pillars. They're called time, talent, and tithe. Okay, some of y'all go here. Uh, Time, talent, and tithe. And then underneath that, the thing that supports that and holds up those uh, uh, pillars would be the, 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 the philosophy of this church, and it's a threefold philosophy. It's prayer, it's praise, and it's preaching, yeah. Uh, this is why we do praise and worship. If you were here from the beginning in 2018, you would notice that was the order of our service. We would pray, we would praise, praise and worship, and then we would preach. Uh, and it's interesting because when we pray, we pray to God. Anybody pray to God? All right. Uh, when we praise, we're praising about God. 
God. And then when we're preaching, we're hearing from God. Okay? Yes, Lord. I'll say it again for the people in the back. So when we pray, what we're doing is we're opening up that dialogue with God. But when we praise, it's because we've already spoken to him and we believe and we know that he's going to do something. Okay? So after I pray and after I praise, all I got to do is now listen, and that's called preaching. He begins to now proclaim. He begins to now speak over me something that I must need in order for my future, something I must need in order to please him. And that is the purpose of preaching. Preaching is not for a whole bunch of amens, but you should say amen. Uh, preaching is not to make people run around the church, but you might want to. Uh, the reality of preaching is to persuade me in a way that I will become pleasing to God. I'm already at point number one and only have two points, so here we are. Uh, we will worship is my thought today, and we will worship, and we will worship beyond tradition. Point number one is worship beyond tradition. Uh, I know some of you might come from Church of God in Christ, P-A-W, Cool J-C, Catholic, Anglican, or Baptist, but the reality of how we will do it is based on Scripture, and a lot of times these denominations are built because they only read one part of the Scripture. Y'all ain't talking to me. Oh, the way I used to say it was the reality of a denomination is that's where they stopped reading the Bible. And so when they stopped reading in Acts, they called themselves Pentecostals. When they stopped reading in the Gospels, all they saw was Jesus get baptized. And wherever they stopped reading, they begin to now build a denomination. But the reality is, he says, I'm not looking for a traditional system. I'm looking for those that will worship in spirit and truth. When I say worship, uh, 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 worship, different thoughts begin to enter your mind. When I say worship, uh, different actions begin to come to your mind. When I say worship, different beliefs begin to come in your mind. Uh, and they settle in. And then you say, well, I don't worship that way. Uh, I don't do it the way that everyone else does it. I do it my own. Me and God have our own relationship. Uh, but tonight, uh, today, I'm going to show you what worship is from the scriptures. Is that all right? All right. Uh, when I say worship, you might have a different thought, but I want to show you what God wants, uh, because the reality is I don't want to keep doing what I think is right if he's not pleased. OK, uh, one of the things we can't miss in this text is Jesus was setting a new paradigm for worship. Uh, they've been doing something for thousands of years. Uh, the mountain that she was referring to is called Mount Gerizim. Uh, and they were worshiping on Mount Gerizim. Those were the Samaritans. And then you had people, Tommy, that were worshiping over here in Jerusalem. And then you have a whole nother group that comes some years later and they're worshiping at Mecca. You have people worshiping all around the same area, but not of them are doing it the way God wants. Mm. Uh, one thing that we can't miss in the text uh, is that God is giving a new paradigm. When I say new paradigm, I'm talking about a new instruction. It's not that he's throwing away the old, but he's beginning to add now to the way it should be done. Oh God, uh, have you ever done something that you thought was right, but it was done the wrong way? Y'all don't want to be real today. Uh, have you ever done anything that you thought uh, you did it pure? You did it honest? You said, you know what, God, I gave you my best effort. And he said, that's not what I wanted though. You know, you, you can slave over a hot stove and you can cook a meal and I not eat it because it's not what I want. Uh, and so when we're talking about worship, it is what God wants, but there is a way he wants it done. OK, uh, because what we'll do is we'll offer this up to God and say, oh, here, take it. And this is where we go back to Genesis and we see Cain and Abel. Y'all was in Genesis study. Anybody with me? OK. Uh, and so this is where we talk about Cain and Abel, because there's a difference in the area of sacrifice. One does not sacrifice it pure and holy. One does not sacrifice it from their interbeing. One doesn't. OK, let me bring it to scripture. One doesn't offer it in the spirit and in truth. And so. The one who doesn't, it's rejected. It's not that he did not offer something, but it was not the way. Somebody say the way. The way God wanted it. Y'all sound good now. Y'all waking up. All right. Uh, and so Jesus is talking here to a Samaritan woman. What kind of woman? A Samaritan woman. This is a woman who is, by Jewish estimation, a half-breed. Uh, I know that's a little rude. Uh, she is, Amy, a half-breed. She is half Israelite and half something else. Okay, some of y'all, y'all know in school, y'all was like, I'm, I'm part Cherokee. You, 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 y'all yeah, lying. 
I'm Spanish. <laughs> Girl, you white. No, I'm Spanish. I'm Puerto Rican. Come on here. Okay. Half breed. She was half Israelite and have something else. And because of that, and this is why I love scripture, because it really doesn't hide any of the, of, of the situations that have gone on in human history. Uh, she's a half-breed, and so she's half Israelite, half something else. It could have been Babylonian, it could have been Assyrian, it could have been anything else. Uh, but the reality is, because she was only half Israelite, uh, she was looked down upon. <laughs> uh, uh, I wish I had some Italians in the room because uh, we understand it from the Italian. I'm, I'm, no, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, I, was about to, I was about to lie. I ain't, I ain't Italian. <laughs> but, but they got a whole nother group of people that they call Sicilians. Okay, am I talking right? They call them Sicilians because they're not fully Italian. They mixed a little something. They skin a little darker. Their hair a little more coarse. And so what happens is they're really just Italians <laughs> when you do your history. But because they're a subgroup of the Italians, they call them Sicilians. The same thing here. Because they're a subgroup. Y'all know what we do. Uh, uh, I don't want to be Haitian. Oh, y'all coughing, uh-huh. They still black. No, I don't want to be Haitian. I'm not Haitian. Don't you fight. I'll fight you. You call me Haitian. It's a subgroup. It's, it's the same thing. We all just black. Come on here. And, and there's really only one race. Let me just, since I'm here. And the, the race is human. <laughs> and as long as the red and blue party, the donkey, you know, who would follow a donkey? And who would follow an elephant? But we stay here fighting. Up, okay, let me get back over here. <laughs> they, they, they playing in your face and you just sitting here fighting. I'm talking about arguing. That's a black woman. They don't want, you know, they don't care about us. <laughs> They're all against the assignment of Jesus Christ. All right. So the Samaritan is a half-breed. Somebody say half-breed. So she's only half Israelite and half something else. Uh, and this detail becomes important because it shows us her religious tradition. And so I'm talking about worshiping beyond tradition, but we must first understand that she was a person of a certain tradition. Uh, and a lot of us, we begin to now start making our tradition our identity. Y'all missed it. Uh, and so her tradition became her identity, and we learned something about her just based on her tradition. Uh, it was the Samaritans that only had what they called the Pentateuch. And um, the Samaritans are still around. I watch some of their stuff on YouTube. It's very interesting. They have, they're, they're different. Um, but but, but the, they only had the Pentateuch. Now, some of y'all don't know what the Pentateuch is, so I got you, see, because I teach and preach at the same time. It's the first five books. Somebody say five. five. First five books of the Bible. Those books were written by Moses. They call it the Pentateuch or the Torah. But the Torah actually is a little more expansive. I, when I first learned this as a kid, we were like, oh, it's the same thing. It's not exactly. The Torah is more expansive. So the Torah is any direction. And so a lot of times the Jews will expand that to oral tradition. They'll call that Torah and they'll call it the Torah. But the Pentateuch is those first five books, uh, yes, Lord, that Moses began to write. And the Pentateuch is important. However, we should understand it's not everything. Mm -hmm. And so the Samaritans only had the Pentateuch. So they only believed part of what God said. It's interesting that she's only half Israelite. Now she only believes in a little less than half of what the Israelites had. Uh, see, that's what happens when we start uh, diverging from truth. We start losing now the rest of the revelation. I'll talk about it in a minute. And so they only had the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. In other words, in our Bible, uh, in other words, she rejected the prophets. Because mind you, we don't got no Jeremiah in the first five books. We have no Isaiah. So now she's missing revelation of the one who's standing in front of her. <laughs> because she has nothing to base it on now. Uh, just so y'all know, there was no New Testament yet, right? We got Jesus standing in front of us. So the Bible, if you will, uh, what they would have used is what we now call the Old Testament. Some would even say the Older Testament. And so the first five books, she has no knowledge or understanding of King David. So now she will not understand who's standing in front of her because he comes down through the lineage of King David. She's missing context. Why is this important? Because she's been worshiping without context. Oh, she's been lifting her hands. She's been laying prostrate, but she does not know fully why she's doing it. It's been passed down in her tradition. 
Y'all with me? Uh, y'all woke up left side? Uh-huh. I'm going to call y'all west side today. The west side woke up. Uh, uh, th- th- this shows us in order to worship, sometimes our tradition, uh, yes, Lord, has to be challenged. Mm, I grew up in the holiness church. My mom used to tell me, shut up. You know why, Ricky? Because I would say, why do we do what we do? <laughs> why is the usher walking around with her hand behind her back? Why she got to wear gloves? We, I, I challenged tradition. And then we find out that a lot of that comes from slavery. They wore white gloves because they wanted to make sure that they could see the hand when it was going in or around the offering basket. (laughs) Little simple things. Come on here. (laughs) My sister's talking about, talk about the point. We point up like we become invisible. (laughs) Excuse me. But mind you, if you had a white glove on, you would be able to see it, right? And so that person's being excused. And so what happens is we sometimes accept traditions, but Jesus came and he challenged traditions. Uh, and then let me help us, because a lot of times we, we get excited. We're like, religion and tradition, God is coming to, no, 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 no. There is traditions that are good, right? We take communion, that's a tradition. Uh, but then there are some traditions that are challenged. And one thing that I learned is if you can't defend it, maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Mm-hmm. I can tell you why we take communion. Y'all not talking to me. I can tell you why we baptize, right? I can tell you why we don't baptize infants. I can defend what we do. Today, I just want to talk about worship, and I want us to be able to defend why we worship. It is one of the foundational things, but a lot of times we don't revisit the foundation, and we don't know what we're standing on. I, I love, uh, <laughs> I love, when I say I love church, I love church, and I grew up in church, and I would notice at my bishop's church, I won't say his name since this is going to go on YouTube, but if you know me, you know my bishop, I would notice that it was about a three-week span, everybody say three weeks, the person would first come in confused, the second week they would come in and they would kind of get in the flow, by the third week they would start running, because everybody else was running, they would start dancing, because everybody, but if you ask them why they were doing it, they ain't got no clue. I was doing it because Manny was doing it. Manny started running, I started running. Then you have the little kids. They start doing it because they're like, hey, I get to have fun in church. And so now they're running. And everybody's running, but nobody knows why. And that's why we have to revisit and challenge some of the traditions because we're running, but we don't know why we're running. So when I talk about worship, I'm going to help us because worship isn't a slow song. Come on, y'all. Let's just worship. Sweet, holy. And everybody's like, huh, okay, cool. Let me do what they do. And we think that worship, uh, we moving from praise to worship now. Come on and lift your, huh? So what was I doing for the last 20 minutes? Because we keep thinking that praise is the fast song. Come on, praise them, praise them, praise them. And then worship is the slow song. And the reality is they're the same thing because it depends on your spirit. So if you're doing it to be seen, come on, people running to the front, showing your socks. Y'all missed that season, church. I'm sorry. <laughs> they, they was wearing pants up to here to show their socks. Then they would start taking them off. Amy is like, what did I come to? Amy, just, just hang in here with me. I've been in church all my life. I'm 37. All my life. I just, I done seen the good, bad, and the ugly. I, 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 listen, amen. And so we would have people show off. They're just showing off. They do what they do to show off, but if they're doing it to show off, then was their spirit in it? Were they doing it in truth? So it doesn't matter. Now, you can run. I'm talking about one Sunday we ran. uh, I mean, we ran. The Holy Spirit was just at work, and we ran and ran and danced, and Ashley was just over here doing all of that, Uh, and, and, and it was God, right? And we know it not because of the performance or the way it looked on the outside, but we knew it by the spirit in which it was done in. Mm -hmm. Worship is uh, 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 not something, watch this, I'm going to mess everybody up. Uh, (laughs) Worship is not something you have to feel. Uh uh Uh-oh, I I feel the spirit of worship in here. Ricky, why why wouldn't everybody was praising God? You didn't, I didn't feel it. Denea, when we had our hands lifted, why did I didn't feel it? I, I just didn't feel. You don't have to feel worship. We stand up on our favorite songs and we sit down on the rest. Why? 
<laughs> because we didn't really come to worship. We came to hear music. We came for bodily exercise. We came for whatever other reason we came for. But did we come for worship? Because worship has a requirement, and it's spirit and truth. All right, I'm moving. You, you don't worship just by coming to church. Uh-oh. Now I'm messing up some of my older traditions. <laughs> the 9 a.m. worship experience. The 1030, come worship with us. That's cute. And it might mean what it means. But the reality is just because I came to church is not in, uh, in and of itself an act of worship. And a lot of us think, okay, well, I came to church. I worship God today. No, 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 no. What did you do when you did there? Okay, uh, let, me, let me say it another way. You can go to work, right? Anybody go to a physical place for work? Because I don't. But anybody go to a physical place for work? Okay. You can go to work, but if you do nothing, did you work? Okay. So, so you can go to worship, but if you don't actually worship, did you worship? And a lot of us, we do the same thing, right? Just like we do at work. We'll go in, we'll clock in, we'll go get coffee. Uh, y'all don't <laughs> I clocked in on time. What you mean? I was on time. No. But did you worship? <laughs> did you do what you were supposed to do? I got to move. Okay. So Jesus immediately shifts the conversation from a geographical debate about traditional worship to an internal posture of the worshiper. He moves from saying, okay, you're talking about mountains and places and locations and genealogies and geography. I want to turn it internally uh, because you're looking at the outer, but God looks at the inner. So I want to know, is your heart postured for worship? Is your spirit, I know your hands aren't lifted, but are you the, the, is your spirit lifted to God? Are you focused on God? Or are you focused on your phone? Y'all not talking. Are you focused on God? Or are you thinking about what you left at home? Are you focused on? That's the spirit of worship. And so Jesus started challenging uh, because a lot of us, as long as we do a lot of activity, we think that we did it for God. So, so Jesus, what he was doing was he was canceling vain traditions. Uh, vain traditions attempt, watch me, to lock the location where you worship. Uh, 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 vain traditions, they attempt to lock the location where worship happens. Okay, so she's talking about Jerusalem. She's talking about mountains. In that day and age, they probably were talking about synagogues and temples, but the reality of worship is worship happens wherever I think of Jesus because I do not need a synagogue in order to worship. All I need to do is understand I love God and begin to worship him out of my spirit spirit and out of the truth of my relationship. And so Jesus basically said to her, uh, do it however you want, wherever you want, uh, but just do it truthfully. Point number two. Uh, so, so the roadmap to true worship, I'm done, is to, here it is, point number two, worship in spirit and truth. The term worship traditionally means to bow down or prostrate oneself. Uh, and so a lot of times when we talk about praise and worship, people actually have it wrong because worship talks about position while praise talks about what you're doing. Uh, so worship uh, traditionally means posture. So whenever they say they worship the Lord, you'll see something like they fell in worship because worship is posture. And so now Jesus is asking, can you worship in spirit and in truth? He's asking, what is the posture of your spirit? I feel like preaching a little bit. Uh, what is the posture of your spirit? Because you came in here like uh, you, God owes you something, but the reality is he's looking at the posture of your spirit. Is your spirit ready to worship or are you ready to just look? Because some of us just think we get brownie points because we came to church and they say, oh, I did a good thing today. <laughs> y'all ain't as old as me, some of y'all. Uh, but it's my one good deed of the day. Y'all remember that? It's my one good deed of the day. I went to church. A lot of us, I feel better. That, that's good, but did you do anything while you was there? The term worship traditionally means to bow down or prostrate oneself. However, Jesus let us know that this isn't just a physical posture, but rather a spiritual posture. Oh, God. And a lot of us, we got to posture our spirits again to say, God, my spirit is prostrate before you. My spirit is bowed before you. I do not come standing in my own strength, but my spirit is humbled before you. Uh, you, 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 you can, uh, yes, Lord, you, you can bend yourself, but never posture your spirit. Y'all ain't talking to me here. Uh, you can shout in church, but you can never, you might not be sincere. So he's looking at the spirit. It's not about your dance and about your articulation. It's about the sincerity 
of what you do. We, we've, we've, we've got people dancing, Tommy, uh, but they're not dedicated to God. And, and God says, you've raised your hands, but your raised hands means nothing if you're not doing it in spirit and in truth. I'm done. Uh, true worship doesn't flow from you doing what the worship leader asks, but rather from a grateful heart expressing your appreciation to the sacrifice of your Savior. I'll say it again because I wrote it and it felt good to me. True worship doesn't flow uh, from doing what the worship leader asks, but rather from a grateful heart expressing your appreciation to the sacrifice of your Savior. Yes, Lord. Uh, when I worship, it's flowing from a deep place, and I don't need music, but it helps me, and I don't need anybody clapping, but it might help. The reality of my worship is it flows from a deep place. Oh, God, and I thank God that he gives me the opportunity to express my love to him. Real worshipers have their hands lifted before anyone ever asked them to uh, because it's happening internally already, oh God. Uh, the real worshiper says, you know what, I'm going to set it off because the reality is I've been through. And since nobody else will be with me on judgment day, one thing he will have to say is I have worshipped him. Uh, worship must calm down. I'm almost there. Worship must be done on God's terms. This is where I wanted to get to today, Tommy. Uh, worship must be done on whose terms? Oh, y'all with me now. Uh, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And the spirit doesn't mean uh, what black holiness Pentecostal preachers told you. Uh, it does not mean that I'm in this deep trance, no. But what it means is that I am sincere, and it's coming from the innermost part of me, oh God. I'm not worshiping just with my head or my hands, but I'm worshiping from the inside out, oh God. And a lot of us, we like to lift our hands to fool others, but no, this worship is for real. Uh, uh, but our worship comes from our spirit to God, and it has to be in, somebody say truth. Uh, this Greek word literally means that it, uh, uh, it can also be understood as reality. Uh, so I have to really do it. I have to do it in real life. Somebody say in real life. Yeah. Uh, I have to do it in real life. But the word truth also means, Danae, it means sincerity. Uh, yes, God. You might not know why the tears are flowing, but it's sincere. You might not know why I cry, I pray, and I praise, uh, but it's sincere. And he's not looking at my action as much as my sincerity. But when you're sincere, your actions will line up with your heart and then you will worship him in spirit and in truth. In, in the context of the New Testament, it conveys the idea of something being real, genuine, or corresponding to reality. Uh, and so this means that falsehood, deception, uh, can't be worship. Uh, yes, Lord. It cannot be worship if it just looks like worship, but it doesn't come from the inside. Uh, so now, when I say lift your hands, don't just lift your hands physically, but you got to lift your hands in your spirit and say, God, I'm surrendering something. God, I'm lifting my hands to you in worship. God, this is an act of worship. I I'm not just doing it because someone else asked me to do it, but I'm doing it because I love you. I'm doing it because you're worthy. I'm doing it because you have been great to me. I'm doing it because you're the only true and living God. I'm doing it because you're amazing. I'm doing it because you're all powerful. This is why. <sighs> yes, Lord, 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 help me. Wor worship flows through your alignment with God's revelation. Okay, uh, let me say it again. Worship flows through your alignment with his revelation. I'll say it one more time so you can get it in your spirit real good. Worship flows through your alignment with God's revelation. Uh, so when I'm aligned with who he is and when I'm aligned with what he does and when I'm aligned with how God moves and when I'm aligned with my knowledge of him, then what begins to happen now is I have reason stored up in me to worship. And all I need, y'all used to say when you fight, but all I need is space and an opportunity, oh God. Uh, and the space might be my car, and the space might be my bathroom, and the space might be my bedroom, but all I need is space and an opportunity. I'm ready now. Uh, tickle the keys and let's go. Uh, because the reality is I have a revelation. Somebody say, I got a revelation. 
Yes, Lord. Uh, what, what is God's revelation? What is God's revelation? What has been revealed about God? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, it's whatever he has revealed about himself. Watch this in Scripture. Uh, God's revelation is whatever he's revealed about himself in your life. Uh, and so I've got a revelation of who he is. Okay, in other words, Amy, I got you. Monty, I got you. Aaliyah, I got you. In other words, when I talk about revelation, I'm done. I'm at the end. It's reasons. <laughs> it's, somebody say reasons. Uh-oh, y'all ain't say it like I wanted y'all to say. Somebody say reasons. Okay, so I have reasons on why I worship the Lord. I worship the Lord, number one, watch me, because God is holy. I worship the Lord because God is eternal. God is the creator. God is love. God is faithful. God is sovereign. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. God is our provider. God is our healer. God is our redeemer. God is our eternal life. God is our peace. He protects us. He fights for us. He is patient with us. And if no other reason, I praise him because he sent his son down through 42 generations to look for somebody to save. He died on a cross looking for someone to save. He was whipped till he was bloody looking for someone to save and so I worship him because I'm the one that he saved I'm the one that he redeemed I'm the one that he healed I'm the one that he loves I'm the one that he provided for I'm the one I dare you turn to your neighbor and say neighbor I'll worship in the good times I'll worship in the bad times. I'll worship when it goes my way. I'll worship 